Hello and welcome back to another Britain's Hidden History. Uh, we're looking at uh, the ancient well, religions and origins narrative put together by Wilson and Blackett. Uh, you've seen a couple of videos the last two days, which I hope you saw. Uh, some nice graphics and everything. Uh, I don't have time to make all the graphics every day, okay? But what I have found in the discovery of the Ark of the Covenant, one of those moments of serendipity, where I was going to pick up my sons and... Uh, just hanging around, just grabbed this book on the way out, opening a random page, and boop, there you go. <laughs> uh, Dragon Parallels. So if you just bear with me, I'm just going to read from it. And then um, my plan is to add some graphics, but it might not happen in time if we're going to get something up as many days on 8 o'clock as possible. So bear with me a second. All right, uh, we'll try the timings on this one. <laughs> then it's quite like this before. So we're talking about the Dragon Parallels. Discovery of the Ark of the Covenant by Wilson and Blackett. I think in chapter 5, looking at Mabinogi. So, in the Brute Tassilio, which is the history of St. Tassilio, who died AD 684, and the Brute Griffith Ap Arthur, known as Geoffrey of Monmouth, there are descriptions of the great comet that appeared in the skies over Britain and that caused enormous devastations to the powerful, civilised and technically advanced island kingdom. Quotes, there appeared a star of great magnitude and brilliance, with a single beam shining from it. At the end of this beam was a ball of fire that spread out in the shape of a dragon. From the dragon's mouth stretched forth two rays of light, one of which appeared to extend its length beyond the latitude of Gaul, France, whilst the second turned away towards the Irish Sea and it split up into seven smaller shafts of light. Close quotes. This description appears to match with the description of a great dragon comet that is in the book of Revelations in the Bible, chapter 12, verse 3. Quotes, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth." Close quotes. In other words, the debris from the tails of a great comet crashed into planet Earth. In verse 7 this description goes on, quotes, And there was war in the heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him." Close quote. This is a clear statement, and it matches with the ancient Egyptian records of the planet or comet Osiris being attacked by Seth and cut into small pieces that fell onto the earth. The ancient notion amongst other nations that the monster Typhon was defeated and destroyed and then cast down into the bowels of the earth is well known. The legends of Sumer and Akkad and of Babylon relate how the Baal Marduk, also called Bel Merodach, the planet, Jupiter, Zeus, fought in the heavens against the monstrous Tiamat and how Merodach, the sun or alias, of the god Ea destroyed the monster by tearing it to pieces. If the archangel Michael is Merodach and therefore the planet Jupiter, then all this begins to make sense. Many years ago, Velikovsky identified the archangel Michael as Jupiter and the archangel Gabriel as the planet Mars, and he was automatically, roundly abused for these evaluations. There is, however, an account in Revelations of an unmistakable Christian biblical tradition of a war in the heavens, and that means a collision between great heavenly bodies in our whole solar system. In 1852, a strange stone was excavated buried some 28 feet below ground surface in the churchyard of St Paul's Cathedral in London. This flat squared stone was carved with the effigy of a dragon that had multiple heads and tongues, 
and multiple curling tails, and an inscription cut around the sides of the stone of the carving accompanying this effigy. The representation of this dragon figure appears to match with the descriptions of the great comet in the ancient British brutes of St. Tassilio and Griffith ap Arthur, and it also matches with the description in the Book of Revelations. The British clearly identified the tragic catastrophe of AD 562 with the account of the dragon and the war in the heavens as described in Revelations. A decipherable, this is what we're looking at now, British Colburn alphabet inscription runs around the sides of the carved stone that depicts the comet of AD 562. And what I'm hoping and requesting is that somebody watching this video can find a, a nice picture showing the text all laid out so we can then attempt to read it and translate it using Welsh and the Colburn cipher. At Hegen in Mordium in Norway, an 11th century Christian church is preserved and it has a decorated weather vane with elaborate carvings. This carvings of a two, of a, of two seven-headed and seven-tailed dragons, one large and one small, that are remarkably like the dragon effigy carved on the stone discovered at St. Paul's Cathedral Churchyard in 1852. This probably also relates to the description of the dragon in Revelations. Other, co other researchers who concentrate upon biblical matters have delved into the matter of convulsions in the heavens of our solar system and made comparisons with ancient Hittite, Canaanite, Babylonian, Egyptian and other remembrances, whilst also noting the copious Greek and Roman records of long ago wars in the heavens. That modern astronomers should seek to distance themselves from astrologers who publish your fortune for today, the week, the month, the year or so, is quite understandable. What is not acceptable is that the astronomers should reject the ancient records of the stargazers who were both professional astronomers and also astrologers. Oh, so I have more thought-provoking stuff from Wilson and Blackett. I am to be doing a lot more videos, um, hopefully every day at 8 o'clock, but uh, <laughs> don't vlog me if I miss a couple of days. Uh, looking into this ancient side of things, ancient connections, Babylonian connections, uh, it really is a fascinating subject. And, and also this uh, this whole thing about the dragon runs through everything. Uh, we're looking at uh, the serpent, it goes all the way back to Genesis in the Bible, the serpent's connected to the dragon, and then... Uh, Something you noticed on yesterday's video was when I was looking for images of Tiamat, I found this creature on the left. I mean, it doesn't take too much imagination to connect that uh, with modern, uh, well, Wales particularly, the Welsh flag, the Welsh symbol. I say Britons because that, that was the Britons before. So I'm talking about, you know, pre-Anglo-Saxon history, which includes a lot of England as well and Scotland Island. So, uh, so if you just take that image there of Tiamat. And we just, uh, there it is, put it on its own. Tiamat, the mother of all gods. You'll find this image on Wikipedia, all sorts of places. It's not obscure. Seems to be generally accepted. And we tip it on its side like that. Doesn't that remind you of a flag suddenly? <laughs> of course it is, yeah. There you go. The, the similarities are really quite remarkable. I mean, if you look here, you've got the sort of the, the one, one arm raised. They've both got similar wings. They've got this similar ghastly, terrible face. Uh, and a pointed tongue. I uh, do notice you've got five toes on Tiamat and four on the Welsh Dragon. I don't know if it's the same in all versions of the Welsh Dragon. Of course, there have been quite a few. Apparently, there's no official one as such. It's just the one that's used on the flag. So, that could be a change. The two tails uh, are different. But again, I mean, similarities seem remarkable to me. <laughs> I don't know if anyone likes to comment that they don't seem remarkable. I'm very interested to hear you thinking about it. So it seems they're all pervading through the histories and looking up, looking at, we've got these Babylonian connections and very interested in the idea of, uh, well, they've got a migration from that area to Wales or Britain, that seems fairly certain. Uh, one of the questions which I'm curious about is, did things start in Britain and then go to Babylon and back again? You know, the poles could have shifted 
uh, made Britain ice locked and had to go on to somewhere with a bit of a better climate, and then returned when it was habitable again. And the reason I say this, things like um, Hugh Evans's new book, Origins of the Zodiac, we can see these zodiacs carved into the skies. I've also got some ideas which I'll be discussing hopefully tomorrow about why the things like the Babylonian star chart make a lot more sense when they're placed in uh, Wales <laughs> than if they originated in uh, Babylon, where they're supposed to have originated. So there we go. I was one to puzzle about. Uh, I may have given some hints before. Have a think about that. I hope you enjoyed this. Please leave some comments and feedback about this format. Uh, they won't be all exactly the same. I'll try and keep more under a quarter of an hour if I haven't waffled on too much. And try and get something up every day. And this will be the theme for a little while now. Okay, so uh, I hope uh, everything's well with you. And wish you peace. Wish you well, she's